So now it's my great pleasure to welcome everybody back to our interactive workshop, Risk Communication, Communicating Science to Non-Scientists and Communication of Values, Trade-offs and Ethical Aspects. Key aspects that were already raised in the symposium earlier. In this session, we will start with two kickoff presentations providing a scientific and a journalist perspective by Daniel Temmermans, Netherlands, and Andrea Slatholm from Norway, followed by a question and answer session. Thereafter, Ashley Houston from the US will introduce an interactive workshop part, which is supported by the SMDM Risk Communication Task Force by facilitating several breakout rooms. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Danielle Timmermans, Professor in Public Health, Risk Communication at Amsterdam University Medical Center, Department of Public Health and Occupational Health. She is the head of a research group on public health risk communication, supervising several PhD students and postdoctoral researchers. Her research is on perception and communication with the public and patients about health and safety risk in order to foster informed adjustment and deliberate decision-making about, for example, prenatal screening, cancer screening and treatment, vaccination and environmental risk. Danielle has a long track record. So for example, from 2013 to 2019, she was chief science officer of risk communication at the National Institute for Public Health and Environment, the IOM, with tasks to develop a coherent, coherent research line on risk communication in collaboration with researchers of different centers of the IFM, as well as external researchers to establish a research network with universities and relevant parties and to stimulate and translate the knowledge to practice and policy. Danielle is a really passionate advocate of communicating high level science to lay people, disseminating research to various audiences and she has been actively involved in COVID-19 discussion linking research, decision maker and policy. Danielle, it's our great pleasure and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Beat. Uh, can you uh, hear me clearly? Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you much for this introduction. Uh, and uh, the RIVM you are just saying is the uh, CDC from the Netherlands. Um, uh, and also, thank you very much for this invitation to this really, really wonderful online event with so many perspectives. I really enjoy this. We'll start sharing my uh, screen. I hope it works. Um, yes, this one. Uh, yes, uh, wait a minute. Um, um, the settings, yeah, I have to, yes, here it is. We'll move the other, the pictures to the, yeah, I have to, yes, okay. Um, well, why isn't this, yeah, okay. So this is my first slide. Um, well, this session is about risk communication and the title of my presentation is how to best communicate the numbers or is there something more to it? Uh, there has been a lot of science, of course, because of the abundance of uh, studies about this pandemic in the media. Uh, and for the public, I think one of the one important part uh, uh, of all these studies is uh, the uh, studies about the health risks, uh, the risks of contracting the disease, uh, the COVID-19, but also the risks related to vaccination. So there are a lot of numbers for the, for the public. Uh, there are many dashboards, many countries have dashboards with many numbers uh, and well, the people has to make sense of it. Um, 
yes, why isn't it working? Oh, yes, okay, it works. It's a little bit slow, but it works. Well, as you all know, uh, vaccination is uh, the way out from this pandemic. It's not uh, finished yet, as we have heard, but uh, it, it really helps. Uh, one of the experts I talked to uh, told me that once 30% of the public is uh, vaccinated, the numbers are dropping rapidly. Vaccination is the way out, but vaccination is always being a contested topic. It has been since the beginning, and maybe uh, you remember uh, the measles epidemics some years ago, 2017, in some countries in, the, in the Europe, and I think also some parts of the US. A lot of people uh, uh, contracted measles because of vaccine hesitancy. As in all uh, medical interventions, of course, uh, uh, vaccination uh, all also involves uh, risks. Uh, because it's uh, given to healthy people, uh, vaccines are thoroughly tested, of course, but um, experts were not surprised if you uh, vaccinate millions and millions of people, some rare events will eventually happen. So the experts, experts were not surprised, but the public was not prepared. Um, it could be expected, but uh, of course, uh, I'm referring to the uh, blood clots, the risk of blood clots uh, with the AstraZeneca vaccination. Uh, epidemiologists quickly pointed out that the risks are very minimal. But even though uh, in many countries the uh, vaccination with AstraZeneca was stopped, was paused, and in the Netherlands there was a pause, twice a pause, and after the EMA, the European Medical Medicine Agency, uh, said that the benefits far outweigh the harms. Uh, our National Health Council decided that it's still not safe for people below 60. And it's apparently safe for people above 60, at least in the Netherlands. It's a little bit different in other countries. As you might know, the UK has a, a cutoff level from 30, 30 years, if I remember correct, correctly. So the epidemiologist pointed out that the risk is really minimal, so there is really nothing to be afraid of. And especially the Winton Center from Cambridge University came with a wonderful, uh, um, with a wonderful uh, visual uh, explaining the benefits and the risk of the AstraZeneca vaccination. Here you see this. You can see the potential harms, the blood clots due to vaccine, and on the left side, the benefits. Uh, preventing COVID, serious COVID-19. Now you have the different age levels. And so you can see uh, with this low incidence of the virus, uh, it's for most uh, age groups, it's still positive. The benefits still outweigh the harms. This is for the very low incidence, and this is for the higher incidence, and then the numbers are more um, positive for vaccination. Uh, and this was even a lower incidence at, at the time, at when the Dutch government decided to stop the vaccination with AstraZeneca, the incidence in the Netherlands was even higher. So the, the benefits were even higher than this. And also the, the people, or the researchers from the Winton Center also compared it with other risks. So uh, also with different age groups. So what is this risk just to help people to make sense of these risks? So, this is the topic of today. Is this good risk communication? What do you think? Well, I will discuss that it is a really good risk communication, but at the same time, I will also argue that it's not very good risk communication. Let's first start with the positive one. Yes, this is very good risk communication. As you see, it's a, it's a clear visual display. Uh, they compare the risks and the benefits side by side using sort of a bar graph. Uh, the references class is clear. So how many people uh, are we talking about? So 100,000 people. You can compare the benefits and the risks from both sides. So it's equal denominator and easy to compare. Frequencies are used, absolute numbers are used, and the very exact information. And people prefer receiving exact information, although many are not good with numbers. And this is in line with uh, the guidelines which is recently presented in an MDM article a few months ago. 
when it wasn't, um, well, this year actually. So this is a good risk communication. The many examples, uh, uh, which, which is a little bit the same layout. This is a, a, a next example from the Harding Center for Risk Literacy in Berlin. This is about the breast cancer screening. You see, uh, you can compare the benefits of screening with not screening. And you see the, at the left, 100 women without screening, 21 dies, die of uh, breast cancer, which for five uh, from breast cancer. And to the left, you can see that uh, that's one woman less out of a thousand which will die from breast cancer. But there are, of course, there are drawbacks like the false positives, the, the light blue dots, and the uh, overtreatment and overdiagnosis and overtreatment, the dark blue dots. This is another example from the Netherlands. The text is in Dutch, but it is about cervical cancer screening, 100,000 people uh, without screening and 100,000 with screening. And you can see that uh, uh, less people are dying from uh, cervical cancer with screening than uh, without screening. Uh, but of course, there are also false positives. Because these chances probabilities are so low, we also decided to present them with official representation of this small chance. And then we think about, well, how can you depict 50,000 people? Well, this is a stadium, at least in the Netherlands, our largest stadium is 50,000 people. And uh, imagine one woman out of the 50,000 people who dies from breast cancer with screening and four without screening. So this was a way to, to present you, to, to communicate the, the risk numbers. And we also tested it and um, among 150 uh, women, uh, there was third condition, the narratives, but it doesn't matter from now, but you must look at the red numbers. Those were significantly different from uh, the other numbers. So women which was shown these visual, visual display had better knowledge and had a better recall from the risk numbers. So apparently this is a good risk communication, but, is this really? Is this really? I will argue that it's not good risk communication because the risk estimates are based on preliminary data as Procenica was mainly used for healthcare personnel with the majority of young women. So there was a lot of uncertainty. Each image uh, above which AstraZeneca is safe differ between countries and people. I read it in the newspapers, 30 years in the, in the UK, Netherlands 60 years, I think Germany 55 years. So there was a lot of ambiguity. And vaccination, as I told you earlier, is a contest issue and people are always worried. The worries are not taken seriously by comparing numbers. So people are not convinced a willingness to be vaccinated with AstraZeneca dropped. These are the numbers from, uh, above are the numbers from uh, the US and you can see that uh, Pfizer and Moderna are the most popular vaccines and AstraZeneca and the Janssen vaccine are less popular. And in the Netherlands, there are 30% to 40% of people after it was passed twice, uh, do, do not want to get vaccinated with, um, with the AstraZeneca vaccine. But in the Netherlands, it was for people um, above 60, safe, the minister said. And just one week ago, he decided that people were refusing the AstraZeneca vaccine were allowed to choose another vaccine. So uh, it didn't take away people's worries. So if this was good uh, risk communication, that I showed you from the Winton Center from Cambridge University, why didn't people believe it? Why is that? That is because risk is more than a number. Different risks are experienced dif differently. People uh, fear the threat from outside, the risk which is coming from outside and not voluntary, not controllable are less acceptable and uh, um, th they are perceived higher than risk from their own behavior. As you all, we all know, smoking is the worst thing to do for your health, but it is experienced differently because voluntary and controllable. So there are certain aspects of the risk which makes a risk unacceptable, which lead to a higher perception. Like being controlled by others, having little benefit, unfairly distributed man-made, et cetera, that all applies to vaccination. Secondly, 
uh, risk perception of risk information is processed in two ways, if you wish, system one and system two. More the rational way, people uh, use that a lot, but also in an intuitive, effective way. When people, when people uh, process the information in a more intuitive way, then uh, it uh, leads to a different risk perception. And it, of course, often when the risks are complex and uncertain, and also when um, the emotional situation, well, that applies to vaccination, of course. And when they uh, process the information in an intuitive and effective way, uh, then probabilities do not matter and only outcomes matter. So either something uh, bad happens to you, awful disease or some environmental risk, or something good happens to you. Well, we need winning the lottery, why not? There's always one person who has to win the 40 million. So the possibility that it can happen is the more important than the probability. Finally, uh, well, comparing risk was also done uh, and uh, people pointed out, uh, well, you, you compared to the positive side for winning the lotto. Well, that is not a very good comparison, but still people buy lottery tickets with a very, 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 very low probability of winning the 40 million. And still people do that. And they also compared it to the um, uh, risk for uh, thrombosis for when you have the contraception pill. And that might not be a very good comparison either because that is an other contested issue. In the 90s, um, there was uh, 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 the pill scare, it was, uh, especially in the UK, it was research. Uh, when you use uh, the, the, the conception pill, there is a risk of thrombosis, but uh, the third generation pill, pill was communicated as twice as high risk for thrombosis than the second generation pill. It was uh, communicated as a relative risk. And according to some articles I refer to here below, it led to, in the UK, 90% extra abortions and more unplanned pregnancies. Which is unfortunate because being pregnant also has even a higher risk on thrombosis uh, than using the, con the contraception pill. When I uh, said that this comparison was not a good comparison in the national newspaper, newspaper one uh, well-known uh, epidemiologist from the Netherlands mailed, emailed me and he said, well, I think you are, you are wrong because it did not lead to a drop of using the uh, gener uh, second generation pill. And this is maybe uh, 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 a link to the, next, uh, to the next presentation about the media that actually he said, um, there was no drop of oh, people just change uh, pills and there was nothing going on. So that led me to the conclusion that maybe the public is wiser than some of us think. Wrapping up, uh, we can see that there are two perspectives on risk communication. The expert model, which is about translating scientific information to lay terms, is about the numbers, uh, presenting them to the people in uh, uh, visual attractive in, um, infographics and there's a citizen's perspective uh, in which threat and control are important and in which risk is more than a number and sometimes when they're uh, effective uh, uh, processing of information we have the binary perception of, of risk it happens or not perceived risk is then the real risk and this is what drives people's behavior so to summarize when we understand risk communication as communicating the numbers. We should use frequencies, absolute numbers, clear visual display, mention the reference class, use the equal denominator. I just referring to the article and the medical decision making. There are a lot of guidelines uh, for how to communicate the numbers better. But when you think about the communication of the risk, you should realize that experts and the public differ in their perspectives on health risks and effective risk communication should take the public's beliefs and perception perspective into account. So thank you, thank you very much uh, for these um, for your attention. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you so much for this very very interesting kickoff presentation that is now followed 
by the perspective of Andreas Slatholm, a Norwegian journalist. Andreas, he started working for the national newspaper Afterposten in 2009 as a reporter. Since 2016, he has been working as a columnist and political commentator. He mainly covers Norwegian politics and decision making. And now I'm looking forward to his insights on media and risk communication starting with a story thinking about bias, public debate, and the role of new media. Andreas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and thanks for uh, uh, having me. Hope you can hear me clearly. <clears throat> I'm going to um, try to uh, share my screen uh, now. Uh, hopefully it will work. Uh, let me just, is it, is it working? Yes. Is it okay? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, um, uh, as I, <laughs> I, thank you for the introduction as well. Um, I am no expert of, uh, of medicine at all. So I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to hopefully provide some insights on uh, you know, the other side of the table, the, how the news media work and how to deal with that uh, as a scientist. I'm going to also, uh, having listened to you, I also have to say that this is not meant as a general defense of uh, sloppy or bad journalism. And there's obviously a lot of it, but hopefully uh, I'll be able to uh, give you some uh, perspectives or, and insight into how uh, reporters and editors are thinking uh, so uh, okay so I'm not able to there yeah okay so I'm gonna start off with something completely else this is the headlines from the Sunday when I started to prepare this presentation uh, it's a, a terrible cable car accident in northern Italy that I guess many of you uh, remember from some weeks ago uh, and I suppose uh, like uh, like me you would probably find this uh, pretty obvious story for media to cover and that is I mean it's a large accident uh, it is in an area that many people have traveled to it's uh, it's spectacular and it meets a lot of the uh, news criteria or the news factors as it's called in in the the academic uh, literature. Uh, this uh, obviously is now um, uh, isn't uh, like the full list of uh, criteria, but uh, but uh, as you can see, the cable car accident needs a lot of these uh, criteria, and these are uh, also uh, general fa factors that always uh, influences the pr priorities in the newsroom. Uh, um, we uh, are prioritizing uh, local or national use over international use. Uh, negativity is better than positivity, meaning that journalism should focus on problems. Uh, complexity is always difficult. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, things that are unlikely to happen is, uh, is uh, more interesting than things that happen all the time. So uh, if, if a cable car uh, broke down or fell down every week, we wouldn't be covering that. But because it's very unlikely to happen, we cover it uh, uh, extensively. So this leads me to this pretty uh, probably obvious, but still uh, worth mentioning uh, conclusion that uh, it's not journalism's task to give a statistical correct impression of uh, reality for journalism to have a, a function we need to cover conflicts more than harmony and to cover uh, war more than uh, peace um, this is uh, this is this graph is of the norwegian crime rate for the last 15 years uh, which uh, i mean the the amount of crime is probably 
uh, written as much uh, in uh, is is written as much about crime in two, 2018 as in 2004 and i wouldn't say it would it should reflect these statistics um but uh, in our uh, in our field the problem is that uh, risk communication uh, at least when defined as you know communicating the numbers uh fits badly with those use uh, criteria. I mean, the fact that that a risk is small isn't making it less spectacular. Uh, and the fact that, for instance, deaths do occur uh, as a side effect from uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine make them possible to re uh, report. And I, I was, I will also, as uh, Timmermans pointed out, that risk in general is a concept that is hard uh, to to grasp to grasp we tend to think of uh, you know possibility rather than uh, probability so um how do you deal with that uh, i'm starting off with some basic advice um, the first one is simply to be aware of the news factors and how is how it is likely that your material will be understood uh, and even as you are the uh, authority you are not uh, in control over the communication process entirely uh, that means that if you're presenting your material and you want the journalist for instance to play down a certain risk because it's not very probable uh, you know you can of course say that and ask the journalist to to uh, to take that into consider consideration uh, consideration sorry <laughs> um, but it, it is not necessarily bad journalism if he chooses not to or if he wants to uh, to to write about the risk anyway to take a, a hypothetical uh, example if I was a, a reporter covering the cable car disaster in Italy and found an expert on cable car security. I think it's pretty probable that he or she would like to stress the low risk of dying from such an accident. And um, I might not find that the most interesting part of what she or he has to say, uh, even though, I mean, it's, I don't say it's all right to misrepresent an expert's view, but I might be the better one in considering what's most interesting to the general public. I think that it that is at least a, a journalistic point of uh, you view, but uh, but uh, her uh, the experts views are uh, of course extremely valuable anyway. So I would want her to answer next time I call, and uh, that is the third small advice that even if it can be hard and you're you're uh, disappointed from time to time. I would encourage every professional and scientist to uh, contributing to the public debate, even if it fails you, because after all, what is the alternative? Um, but then I think it's important to think through uh, what is actually the, the goal of your risk communication or your scientific communication. Uh, uh, in the end, people will make their own decision. Uh, and as a scientist, you probably want them to be informed, uh, but you cannot influence their decisions unless they trust you. So trust both uh, specifically as a, a single scientist or a single uh, CDC or whatever it is, but also in science uh, in general is, is the most important factor, I believe, uh, when uh, communicating in the public. Um, and um, this uh, this is not an argument, at least uh, from my point of view, for persuasion or per, um, a, a strategy that uh, that are trying to convince people to to do uh, do some specific action, uh, because that that could easily be be, uh, be uh, failing. Because, um, and I'm going to exemplify with some Norwegian examples from the, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, because the question, um, and obviously, is how to deal with the uncertainty and lack of evidence and professional disagreement, which have been discussed earlier in this uh, session. And my answer will be that, uh, well, 
you cannot hide them. Openness and transparency is, uh, is the key to trust in general. And this goes also for scientific uh, communication. Um, uh, in, um, this is an example from March 2020 when Norway uh, was, uh, the, the lockdown was uh, just imposed. And from the very beginning, the, the Public Health Institute, which is the Norwegian CDC, uh, in, were uh, extremely clear uh, and public about their views and their advice, even uh, when they differed from the, uh, the actual decisions. This is from like, uh, I think it's the day after the lockdown where the Public Health uh, Institute uh, sent out a press release that uh, uh, voiced concern over the school closures. Uh, and uh, they were uh, very clear that this was not their advice. And I think, um, and, and that made it possible for us on the right hand side as journalists to immediately start writing about disagreements among stakeholders and experts and uncertainty and how the decisions were actually made. Um, and uh, I think intuitively many would say that, you know, this is a very serious situation with a very serious uh, pandemic going on that requires a unified voice as people need to trust the decisions. But the reality was that this was, uh, there were different opinions and, and uh, the Public Health Institute had their view uh, and, um, and uh, people then get more informed. They get informed that, uh, uh, that about this disagreement and they understand the uncertainty. Uh, and um, in surveys, there are no signs of this being a challenge to uh, trust in government du during the pandemic because this type of openness and transparency has been the policy of the Public Health Institute uh, throughout the whole, whole pandemic. And uh, I think it is a very good case for, for, uh, for, uh, for uh, what it means with transpar uh, transparency in practice. And then you might ask, um, uh, sorry, I, let's see. Yeah, then you might ask, can it be too much, too much openness? Uh, this is an example from also from the Public Health Institute in, in uh, Norway. It's from January and has nothing to do with the uh, AstraZeneca vaccines. Um, there was a press release stating that very frail elderly people were dying after having received the Pfizer vaccine. Um, at the, and that uh, the, the scientists were looking into a possible connection. And this received a lot of attention, both uh, nationally and uh, not at least internationally, um, uh, because I think news organization maybe understood this connection to be more established than it really was. Uh, um, so, so the Public Health Institute received a lot of criticism for uh, scaring people on an uncertain basis, and uh, doctors feared this would lead to to uh, uh, vaccine hesitancy uh, among elderly people if, uh, uh, if this risk was uh, overplayed. But it turned out that uh, not only were such a connection established, uh, it also had uh, no effect on the uh, willingness to uh, get the vaccine. Uh, you might say, um, uh, 40 very frail elderly people dead from the vaccine isn't much and shouldn't receive a lot of attention. But then again, in the name of openness and transparency, I think it is important that these aspects also are part of the public debate and, and can be discussed. And as we see, it did no harm or it couldn't possibly, <laughs> almost, uh, uh, it's almost impossible that it could uh, have done any harm as the vaccination rate among uh, the elderly in Norway is 96%. And I know that, you know, Norway is a high trust transparency in general. So it might be easier to have this strategy uh, in Norway than some other country. But, but then again, it's an uh, egg and chicken situation. You know, I think these um, um, measures are also part of the reason why the level of trust is so high. And I also have to uh, add that uh, this uh, strategy differs uh, from uh, Denmark, for instance, 
where the disagreement among uh, about school closures and lockdown measures uh, initially weren't uh, weren't on display publicly before uh, one year or like a, a few months ago so so this isn't uh, this is a, 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 a spread conscious strategy from uh, from Norwegian uh, health authorities that I think is uh, is very uh, good. Um, so uh, to conclude, I understand that people involved in risk communication often can uh, be skeptical towards uh, news media's role as a, as a dramatizing and exaggerating uh, institution. Uh, and the, the underlying fear, of course, is that people in general go around and feel uh, unnecessarily scared all the time. Uh, and even though it's true that uh, news media uh, delivers a more dramatic and dangerous world than reality for most people, the question is what this really leads to. Um, I do believe that many people understand this logic, at least to a certain degree. They want to to get the problems on the table and uh, uh, and 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 they are reading uh, the, the newspapers not as not as uh, uh, reality as such but as uh, journalistic uh, products and i think it's also worth mentioning uh, in regards to the pandemic that in norway a lot of medical experts doctors mainly have uh, have uh, or physicians have voiced uh, like opposite concerns of the pandemic. The risks uh, uh, are underplayed rather than overplayed, and they wanted to see even um, stronger measures uh, being taken, and uh, want the media to to you know scare a little bit more. And from our point of view as journalists. The job is to secure a public sphere where these uh, professional disagreements can be discussed, uh, disagreements can be taken out in the open, and so that everyone gets a little smarter and more informed. And the best way of doing that for uh, uh, scientists, I think, is to participate, uh, show openness and transparency, and keep uh, building trust in science by doing uh, that. So. Um, so that was what I was uh, going to say. <laughs> Thanks for having me. And uh, I hope I, I um, provided some per perspectives that was useful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andreas. And now the floor is yours to the entire audience. Um, put your questions in the chat. And Ashley will help me a little bit with reading the chat. So I see that there are already questions coming in. And um, let me start with what you just said, that uh, how we can help. But I think it's now the question, how, how does it really work? So disagreement and transparency is key to trust. But it's also the case that there are often situations where most of the vast majority of experts say one thing, but a small minority say something else. It seems important for journalists to convey not just that disagreement exists, but also the relative balance of expert opinions. So how can we help ensure that it occurs? Any thoughts on this? Um, you want to go first, Andreas? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I can try from to. From my side also uh, for the journalists, what I perceive uh, if you if I make I, can I say something and then you comment on my comments is that uh, also good absolutely uh, please start <laughs> comment on my comment because uh, I think uh, Brian is is right that there are also situations in, in journalism when journalists uh, are is, uh, looking for one expert which, which disagrees uh, we had that in uh, some other contested issues environmental issues and uh, they couldn't find toxicologists in the Netherlands so they find Effectively, they found one in Belgium who disagreed, but he was not really an expert. Uh, but uh, uh, I think in these situations, when uh, uh, the journalists are purposely uh, looking for an expert which, who disagrees, uh, then there is a different agenda. And then the journalist is not helping uh, the public debate, but is acting uh, as a watchdog. Uh, 
for the government uh, or whatever, and there are a lot of interest at stake. Uh, so uh, I think behind this, uh, well, this observation from uh, Brian, I think there is a diff it is about different agendas and then there are really uh, different interests uh, at stake. And then I think the journalists take a different role. I'm not sure if you, uh, you agree, Andreas. This is my yeah. observation. Yeah, you might, uh, you might, uh, I, I do agree. I also would say that this is all, it's very hard to discuss this like in general because every, every case and every story is different. And uh, obviously there are a lot of uh, bad journalism, as I said, where, where you, you're, uh, where you have this false balance that have, uh, that is, uh, that can be a problem. But then again, I would, without going into details, I, now there's, you know, the, the origin of the virus, uh, for instance, is, is now seriously discussed. Uh, and we as journalists um, couldn't know the, what was happening with, you know, with the Biden administration's stance on this, like one year ago. So one year ago, everyone was, uh, I mean, I, I'm not going into details there, but for us, it's also important to have openness. Andreas, we can't hear you anymore. Okay, I'm sorry. Didn't you hear my answer at all? Or only part. Last time. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Um, yeah, I'm. Uh, uh, I'm. I was just going to say that it's hard to uh, judge on every. Uh, like uh, you have to go into details of the uh, of every story, but uh, but it's hard for journalists also to to uh, you know judge on what is what is the, the um, uh, scientific communi uh, community's general uh, opinion. So uh, for us also, uh, disagreements are part of the, 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 the process and we have to cover it and we, we can't know what happens with research in the future. So, so um, uh, yeah, that's part of the answer, but yeah. So would it be uh, helpful that Maybe in some situation, we as societies uh, communicate a little bit more emerge uh, opinion and uh, therefore support you as, uh, as uh, journalists. Do yeah, my... as experts first? Wait, you're really suggesting that? No, it's just that, uh, that we bring together several voices of experts. You know, and that it's not the, the, the journalists. I mean, for them, it's hard to, to find out. <laughs> well, that will never happen. Experts agreeing. <laughs> I don't think that will be a good thing. You have to have this agreement to just uh, and uh, have it in the open. And I agree with Andreas that you should have it in the open and discuss it. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, experts never agree. That's my experience in the, especially not about contested topics. I don't think it's good. <laughs> Experts agree. Okay. Yeah. Good. Then maybe Ashley, could you pick some of the, the topics since we have quite some and we only have two minutes left. So some quick questions. Sure. Uh, it looks like there's a question here from Alistair. Uh, regarding the AstraZeneca vaccine in England, there have been a lot of messages and discourse that have been quite nationalist, uh, like naming it the Oxford AstraZeneca and trying to get the UK flag on the vaccine. And um, Alistair was wondering your thoughts on how, if this kind of messaging might have influenced the trust and risk perceptions of the vaccine in European countries. Because it was um, a UK vaccine, we don't trust the AstraZeneca. Well, we have the Janssen vaccine, or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is Leiden. Uh, uh, well, yes, I think there is a general underlying distrust to pharmaceutical companies, and especially uh, AstraZeneca, because they uh, promised to deliver more than they did. So that didn't help. And that is more related to the, uh, they didn't uh, live up to their uh, promises. Uh, and especially when it also came out that uh, there are a lot of uh, vaccines uh, from the Oxford vaccine was produced in the Netherlands, but exported to the UK. 
but not the other way around. So that is for the government, uh, for the EU government also uh, a thing, uh, uh, a problem. Uh, I don't think so much for the general public. And for general public, the problem was, oh, there is danger. And uh, the minister decided to stop the vaccination with the AstraZeneca. And when that picture is out, it's over. It's a danger and you cannot correct it anymore. Well, not for a, a large minority. That's what I think it happened. And Andres, when you're making decisions about how to describe the vaccine in print, um, how do you determine what name to use or uh, what to include when you're um, writing? Uh, well, um, I, I can. Uh, I just wanted to make an uh, another uh, another point to that because um, I think it's very interesting. Uh, interesting with this, um, you call it na a nationalist uh, approach. And I would say that, uh, as you may know, the the blood clot, uh, clot side effects were discovered first in Norway and Denmark, which are also the two countries that ended up uh, excluding them completely. Uh, from the vaccination program, and I think uh, that's uh, part uh, that would never have happened if they were discovered first in another country, due to the massive media coverage, which was all also somehow you call it nationalistic. But but I mean the researchers in Norway were almost national celebrities, uh, in, and their discussions with with other colleagues in other countries were covered heavily, and that of course influences the perceived risk among the population so uh, so so um, I, I mean even I, I'm not saying that it was, this was the right decision for Norwegian and Danish authorities but I uh, but I understand it as a rational decision because the side effects are giving so much attention in the public debate in uh, in Norway so oh, unfortunately, we ran out of time now for our uh, question and answer part. And with this, I really, really want to thank the two speakers. And maybe you can take some time to address some of your uh, answers in the chat now. But we now continue with our uh, interactive part. So now we are all curious about how we can do better dealing with uncertainty, communicating benefits and harms, learning helpful tools to use from Ashley Houston and her task force team. Ashley is an assistant professor in the Division of Public Health Science in the Department of Surgery at Washington University School of Medicine. She is an occupational therapist by training and her research focuses on shared decision-making, cancer prevention and implementation of science. Specifically, she is interested in the implementation of decision support strategies to improve health behavior and outcomes, particularly in populations that experience cancer-related health inequalities. Thank you so much, Ashley, for now leading our workshop. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. And I'm really excited to lead this interactive portion. And I'll share my screen now. All right. Are you able to see the full screen? Ashley, it's in the okay. presenter mode that we see. Okay. Let me switch it up. Thank you. I thought I had set that up already. Sorry about that. Now it's good. Okay. Thanks. Here's the full screen. So uh, again, thank you for the kind introduction. And um, for the next 15 minutes, I'll be talking about some of the key concepts related to risk communication. And we've identified four key concepts to discuss during uh, this session today. So the first one is conveying uncertainty. Second is communicating benefits and harms. The third is informing and influencing messages versus influencing messages. And the fourth is numbers and probabilities. 
And I will do my best to summarize these key concepts, but uh, in fact, I could teach an entire semester on risk communication. So this will be an overview of these four topics. And I'm hoping that in these breakout sessions, you'll be able to dive into these topics um, in a little bit more depth. So I do wanna start off by highlighting why risk communication matters. And our speakers have done such an important job highlighting the importance of communicating to the general population. But I also wanted to bring up when thinking about risk communication with patients, health literacy and numeracy are really central. And health literacy is the ability to obtain, process, understand and communicate health information to make informed health decisions. And numeracy is the ability to understand and use numerical information. Health literacy and numeracy really matter because they are strong predictors of health outcomes, even when compared to other sociodemographic characteristics like education, income, and race and ethnicity. And limited health liter literacy is prevalent in many countries and estimates of basic or inadequate health literacy range between one third to one half of the population. Um, and that's been found in the US, uh, UK, and in Australia. And on the right-hand side here, the figure shows um, that even among those with advanced degrees, the majority have less than proficient health literacy. And when we're communicating risk, it's really at that intersection of health literacy and numeracy. And so um, the evidence-informed health literacy message can, messages, sorry, evidence-informed health literacy methods can help to enhance our risk communication. So jumping into the first topic uh, with uncertainty. So, um, uncertainty extends beyond just the typical variation of chance. Aleatory uncertainty represents the randomness or indeter indeterminacy of future events. And on the other hand, epistemic uncertainty is the lack of knowledge needed to predict future outcomes, also known as ambiguity. And it's concerned with the lack of reliability, credibility, or adequacy of risk information. And ontological um, uncertainty are the limitations of the models when using reality and represent the unknown unknowns. So what does this look like in medical decision making? This can happen when there's limited or emerging evidence. So for example, in the context of COVID-19, accelerated approvals for the vaccine may not have included evidence for how the benefits or safety will hold up over time, even extending past the duration of the trial. And uncertainty can also be observed by conflicting opinion or evidence. And in the US, uh, this is a continued debate surrounding breast cancer screening for women of average risk in their 40s. This debate persists and the use of evidence and opinion influence how recommendations are made and operationalized in cancer settings. And uncertainty of, the future, out of future outcomes can occur in the context of those who elect to forego treatment or screening and and in the context of genetic testing, when variants of unknown significance are observed and possibly no action is um, able to be taken. And translating population level data to the individual adds uncertainty to if the event will occur. Uh, sometimes there's something about the patients that make the risk models not fit for them. And so acknowledging where there is uncertainty is important. So I was looking for uh, examples to show here, and this is really difficult. Uh, it's really difficult to convey uncertainty and the evidence is mixed. So for aleatory and epistemic uncertainty, it's often not well understood and the use of probability estimates and confidence intervals are used in different patient facing communications, but those are, you know, the evidence is mis mixed. Um, they're often not that well understood in, among patients. And for ontological uncertainty, uncertainty about the entire modeling process um, and really using more of a qualitative or subjective language to acknowledge the limitations of these models and our knowledge is important. So the next topic is communicating benefits and harms and um, benefits are thought to be the positive health outcomes associated with making a decision, whereas the harms represent the negative outcomes a patient may experience. And this can often be described as the physical, psychological, financial, or financial benefits and harms. So for example, in the context of cancer screening, a physical benefit of screening could be detecting cancer early where you can have treatment early, um, while harm may be additional testing, which may include invasive tests and um, also false positives. 
And for patients, their tolerance of risk varies and may value, they may value benefits and harms differently. So for example, health benefits of a particular decision may be high, yet the quality of life trade-offs may be of higher value to that patient. And for benefits and harms, visual depictions are often used. So just one example here, um, this is a decision aid for heart disease. And this offers a visual depiction of and, tech, and a text description of benefits and harms using an icon array. So it describes the reduction of risk of heart disease, uh, reducing your absolute risk from 16% to 12%. And it also describes the costs associated with the pill and the potential side effects that 28 of 1,000 people may develop diabetes on a statin compared to 24 in 1,000 on the placebo pill. I just wanted to show another example. Uh, this is from ePrognosis. And uh, this example, uh, demonstrates the benefits and harms of cancer screening uh, side by side. And this is using uh, text, and this is for uh, breast cancer screening, a mammography. And harms include discomfort, anxiety, additional tests, finding a cancer that would have never caused a problem or symptoms in a woman's lifetime, so over diagnosis topics. And the number of benefits and harms differ slightly. So the, the list of harms um, slightly outnumbers the list of benefits. But that's just how it appears visually, and it's not considering the magnitude of benefits and harms. So this leads to our next category of informing versus influencing. So all humans do have systematic biases that can impact their decision. In the context of informing when presenting risk information to patients, the goal is to present the information and options while limiting bias that may persuade the patient in one direction or another. This is like giving the patient the information and the options and allowing them to be the ones who decide which direction to go. In the context of influencing, there may be a reason to address bias and persuade patients to move toward a certain decision. And this may be used if there's a decision uh, that, that will lead to a specific outcome. So this could be used in the context of uh, if there's strong evidence for the public health. Um, so using uh, for example, seat belts or smoking cessation, the evidence is strong and the magnitude of benefit is thought to be great. So this may compel someone to make a certain decision. In addition, the current risk and future risk for certain diseases where you do nothing may be used to influence a patient's decision. So for example, using an icon array, um, it states that if you improve your diet, you could gradually reduce your risk of having a heart attack or stroke in the next five years from 16% to 11, and your risk is now medium, not high. So this may be used to help patients move toward a certain direction of risk uh, to reduce their risk. However, when thinking about using informing or influencing communication, when using risk communication strategies like an icon array, there is the potential um, that it may in fact, demotivate people. So there may be conditions when you might want to think about whether or not to use an icon array, particularly when looking at behavioral modification. So not just informing patients, but looking to actually change their health behaviors. And it's important to use a strategy that will align with the purpose of your risk communication, as all strategies for risk communication are not the same, particularly when looking at decision making versus behavioral, behavioral change outcomes. And for number four, talking about numeric probability. So um, numeric probability is a statement in numbers about the likelihood of an event, such as heart disease causes one in four deaths, or a patient has a 5% chance of side effects from a medication. Materials may use numeric probability statements to convey risk from exposures, behaviors, or hereditary characteristics. And risk statements that solely rely on numbers may be difficult for audiences to understand, and people may better understand probabilities when they're presented in words with visuals that match to reinforce the meaning of numbers. And so um, thinking about typically people more easily understand natural frequencies and absolute risk rather than relative risk. So this is an example uh, when looking at the number of Americans who died of COVID by March 2021, you can see that the denominator varies and it's a little bit difficult to get a sense of the impact when you need to do the cal calculations on your own. But then when looking at, at this um, out of 10,000 people, you can get a clear comparison between uh, the different race, race, race and ethnic groups and um, the number of Americans who have died. In addition, here's a, two examples. You may recognize the example from the left. This is the heart disease, disease, disease decision aid again. And then on the right is a risk ladder. Um, so on the left, you can see that there are explicit numbers. If you start, 
stop smoking, you could gradually reduce your absolute risk from 16% to 9% and your new risk is considered low. Compared to the figure on the right, your disease risk, where they use colors and visuals to depict your risk and what type of changes that would be mo most impactful. So for example, if this patient control, uh, controls their diabetes, that will make a greater impact on their risk compared to eating more nuts, which is further down on the list. So while there are no explicit numbers, the visual depictions are used to convey the numerical information. So I'd like to introduce, with that brief uh, and quick introduction to risk communication, I would like to introduce our breakout room activity. And so um, I realized that we talked about this topic these topics very quickly, but I would be happy to have you discuss them in more depth in our breakout rooms. Um, so we have the opportunity to apply this information to a decision aid that we selected, and in just a few minutes, we'll send you out into breakout rooms uh, with our experts in risk communication to review the decision aid and go through this checklist and talk about some of the key topics that we presented. And I'd like to thank the risk communication special committee, uh, and they will be facilitating these focus, these uh, breakout rooms. Thank you, Ashley, and your team. So I hope you all enjoyed our journey today, starting from lost in translation, the need of sciencing, tackling inequalities, defining, communicating values upfront, building data environment for improved decision support, making inequalities visible up to effective communication. So please join with a great applause for all extremely dedicated speakers, facilitators, and all the helping hands in the background and our wonderful audience. So now it's time to continue our discussion in a more relaxed environment to meet friends and colleagues, new attendees, in our social event in Wondermy. So the link is in the chat already. Keep in mind that uh, when you enter the Wondermy environment, here you would specify your camera, your microphone, you would take a picture and add your name and then take the time to walk around and uh, to go to the specified areas, to have a coffee, to have a tea, or just meet people that are next to you and you can also find them in the participants list and wonder me if you search for specific people. So with this, we are at the end of this part of the session and many, many thanks to all of you and hope to see you in wonder me in a minute. <laughs>